Good morning, Epiphany. It's great to see everybody this morning. The announcements are inside your service leaflet. They are in yellow. Um, please take them home with you and take a look at them. See what is going on in the church. It includes the service times for Christmas Eve, which will be 4 o'clock and 10.30 p.m. for all of you who are making plans and a bunch of other things that are going on. Um, so there's still time to place your order for Christmas poinsettias if you want to do that between now and tomorrow morning. Um, and before I forget, because I always forget every week, there is coffee hour after the service. We welcome anybody who's visiting with us to join us for coffee hour. It's just down the hall, all the way down and to the right. Um, we have a number of parishioners this week who are traveling um, back home to Africa or around the country um, to visit friends and family. So as you're doing your prayers this week, please include all those parishioners who are out and about traveling in the world. We all know how holiday travel gets. Um, I will miss them and look forward to having them back. Uh, my last announcement is a, an announcement of gratitude. I want to thank everybody who worked so hard on the Christmas pageant, which was yesterday evening. It was immensely special and so much fun. All the parents who helped their children, all the children who volunteered, Gail Wood, who is our Sunday school director and helped coordinate. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Please kneel for the Decalogue. Hear the commandments of God to his people. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of bondage. You shall have no other gods but me. You shall not make for yourself any idol. The Lord have mercy upon us, and incline our hearts to keep this law. You shall not invoke with malice the name of the Lord your God. The Lord have mercy upon us, and incline our hearts to keep this law. Remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. Honor your father and your mother. The Lord have mercy upon us, and incline our hearts to keep your law. You shall not commit murder. The Lord have mercy upon us, and incline our hearts to keep your law. You shall not commit adultery. The Lord have mercy upon us, and incline our hearts to keep your law. You shall not steal. You shall not be a false witness. The Lord have mercy upon us, and incline our hearts to keep this law. 
You shall not covet anything that belongs to your neighbor. And write all these thy laws in our hearts, we beseech you. Lord be with you. Let us pray. Purify our conscience, Almighty God, by your daily visitation, that your Son, Jesus Christ, at his coming may find in us a mansion prepared for himself, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Please be seated for the reading. Our first reading is from the book of Isaiah. Again the Lord spoke to Ahaz, saying, Ask a sign of the Lord your God, let it be deep as Sheol or high as heaven. But Ahaz said, I will not ask, and I will not put the Lord to this test. Then Isaiah said, Hear then, O house of David, is it too little for you to weary mortals that you weary my God also? Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. Look, the woman is with child and shall bear a son and shall name him Emmanuel. He shall eat curds and honey by the time he knows how to refuse the evil and choose the good. For before the child knows how to refuse the evil and choose the good, the land before whose two kings you are in dread will be deserted. The word of the Lord. The song for today is portions of Psalm 80. We will read the psalm responsibly by whole verse. Hear, O Israel, excuse me, hear, O shepherd of Israel, leading Joseph like a flock. Shine forth, you that are enthroned upon the cherubim. Restore us, O God of hosts. Show the light of your countenance, and we shall be saved. You have fed them with the bread of tears. You have given them bowls of tears to drink. Restore us, O God of hosts. Show the light of your countenance, and we shall be saved. And so we will never turn away from you. Give us life that we may call upon your name. The next reading is from the letter of Paul to the Romans. Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, set apart for the gospel of God, which he promised beforehand through his prophets and holy scriptures, the gospel concerning his son, who was descended from David according to the flesh and was declared to be the son of God with power according to the spirit of holiness by resurrection from the dead. Jesus Christ, our Lord, through whom we have received grace and apostleship to bring about the obedience of faith among all the Gentiles for the sake of his name, including yourselves who are called to belong to Jesus Christ. To all God's beloved in Rome who are called to be saints, 
Grace to you and peace from our God, our Father, and the Lord Jesus Christ. The word of the Lord. Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to Matthew. Glory to you, Lord Christ. Now the birth of Jesus the Messiah took place in this way. When his mother Mary had been engaged to Joseph, but before they lived together, she was found to be with child from the Holy Spirit. Her husband Joseph, being a righteous man and unwilling to expose her to public disgrace, planned to dismiss her quietly. But just when he had resolved to do this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife, for the child conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and you are to name him Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what had been spoken by the Lord through the prophet. Look, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall name him Emmanuel, which means God is with us. When Joseph awoke from sleep, he did as the angel of the Lord commanded him. He took her as his wife, but had no marital relations with her until she had borne a son and he named him Jesus. The Gospel of the Lord. In the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Please be seated. I do take my faith quite seriously, but I also have an irreverent sense of humor about it. I enjoy sending funny religious cards to my friends. It's hard to find cards like that, though, because for some reason, Hallmark thinks the religious people only want to purchase saintly cards with crosses and sunsets and rhyming prose. So whenever I find a whimsical or a particularly funny card, I buy it. And I keep it for weeks, waiting for just the right friend's birthday. Last October, I found a special card for a very old friend of mine. The front of the card had a serious-looking painting of a slightly sad but expectant Jesus wearing long, flowing white robes with a mysterious light emanating behind him. He's standing outside in a garden just about to knock on a huge oak door. And when you open up the card inside, it says, Look busy, 
Jesus is coming. <laughs> I sent the card to my friend on his birthday. Part of what makes it so funny for me is that it hits so close to home. This is how many, if not most of us, prepare for Jesus coming at Christmas. We wait, and often our version of waiting includes getting busy. We have all been pregnant with Advent for three weeks now, along with Mary. We've only had to wait three weeks. She's been waiting nine months. We have one more week to go until Christmas Day. If your family is anything like mine, you have a kind of a punch list of things still to get done before Christmas arrives. Mine is magnetized to my refrigerator door, and I add something to it every day. By now, most of us have put the wreath on the front door, or candles in the windows, or strings of lights all over the house, bushes. We have bought presents and sent cards. And in Richmond, many of us have participated in the long tradition of driving around for the Tacky Lights Tour, one of my favorites. Meals are planned, family visits are coordinated, and we have been to the grocery store more than once. We are going to be really prepared when this baby arrives. We are determined that our lives are going to be in order, and we are confident that we know what's going to happen when that baby comes, down to the last detail that we can control which is why today's story might make us more than a little bit uncomfortable if we look at it. Because our dear Joseph, his life has been completely in order up until now. He is betrothed to a young woman, Mary. He is waiting like we are, but he is waiting for his marriage to be finalized. Marriages back then were quite different from ours these days. Joseph was officially betrothed to Mary, and that is more legally serious than our modern engagements. They were legally and spiritually bound to each other already, but they were waiting. The Gospel writer does not tell us why. Maybe Mary was still too young to get married, or maybe Joseph wasn't financially stable enough to support a family of his own, and he'd been living in his mother's basement. One day, probably soon, they would finalize their marriage and move in together and start a family. <coughs> and I imagine Joseph happily anticipating his future. And into that expectation of the future, right into the middle of Joseph's everyday first century Jewish life, breaks the kingdom of heaven. And frankly, God showing up does not start out sounding like what you would call good news. Mary is found to be pregnant. Joseph looks like a cuckold. To all appearances, he is betrothed to an adulteress. We just talked about that. Do not commit adultery. This is the beginning of God's good news. I imagine Joseph's waiting took on an air of desperation and sorrow, grief even, over what might have been and what now was his life. I wonder how long he took to think about all of this before he finally decided to set Mary aside quietly. How long would it have taken him to absorb the shock of what had happened? Now, the specifics of the law allowed for a woman in this situation to be stoned to death. We don't think that that ever actually happened, but it is a very serious offense. But the one word that we have that the Gospel writer Matthew uses to describe Jesus as human father, the one adjective we get to describe Joseph out of the entire Gospel, is that Joseph was righteous. That isn't to say self-righteous, not like the word that we use today. Do not imagine Joseph as some kind of sanctimonious, self-absorbed, holier-than-thou person. Joseph's righteousness was about living a life of justice through the law. And from what we can see in this story, that justice was founded in love. Love for God 
and love for his betrothed wife, Mary. He chooses not to shame her in front of everyone they know. He decides instead, after much thought, to set her aside quietly and wait for something different in his life. He will continue his life with a new set of expectations about what it will be. And brothers and sisters in Christ, the kingdom of heaven bursts right into his life, right then and there. Behold, we are told, an angel, a messenger of God, is revealed to Joseph one night in his dreams. The angel, knowing Joseph in all the fullness of his identity, says to him, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid. Do not be afraid of what has happened, but especially don't be afraid of what is going to happen. Because all of this that looks like a mess is from the Holy Spirit. The gift of this child is the fulfillment of the prophecy about God's love, embodied into flesh in the world of everyday, ordinary people. God is coming to be with you and me. Frankly, if you think about that long enough, that whole idea is more than a little bit scary. Do we really understand what we are welcoming? No wonder we tame the story of Christmas and soften it and turn it into a charming tale of a young mother and a father and a sweet and quiet baby and very clean swaddling clothes, some soft and cuddly sheep, a gentle donkey, some loving shepherds. Perhaps all of our frenetic activity and getting ready for Christmas is because we are afraid to spend that time instead looking into the depths of God's love for us. The angel tells us, do not be afraid, because the angel knows that we are. We are afraid of letting God get to know us and deciding that we are not really worthy. God is much safer far away. We try our hardest to busy ourselves in order to do things right before God shows up in our lives. And we can mistake being right for being righteous. We are afraid of being judged and found wanting. But I will tell you the secret that really isn't a secret. It is in plain sight in the middle of today's story. God already knows Joseph, and God already knows us. There is, in fact, nothing that we can do to make ourselves worthy to welcome God into our lives. God already knows us, and God knows we need to be saved from our sins. The angel tells us that that is Jesus' mission. It is Jesus' life purpose to save us. We don't need to hide ourselves and hide our brokenness under the perfection of our preparations. God knows us, and God comes. God comes as pure grace into our broken and imperfect human lives. That is God's gift to us. God comes because we need God. God does not come because we prepared for him just right. Our true task is not to prepare for God's arrival, but to prepare for our response to God's arrival. Are we courageous enough to respond as Joseph did, in love and faith, welcoming God fully into our lives? No wonder that angel starts out by telling us, do not be afraid. I, for one, treasure my illusion that I have control over my own destiny that the decisions I make create the life I live into. I have never been so great at that wonderful little saying, let go and let God. 
I am holding on for dear life. I prefer to fool myself into thinking I have everything under control, my private life, my professional life, my friendships, my family. If I cannot actually make my life perfect, I can try to make it look perfect to other people. When God shows up in Joseph's life, God does not make Joseph's life any easier. The next thing Joseph knows, wise men show up bearing gifts. Herod gets jealous. The angel comes back with a warning. Joseph has to grab his family and flee into Egypt, and Herod slaughters all of the innocents. It sounds far from perfect. But here, take a look again into the depths, because human life is like this. It is really, really messy and very unpredictable. God does not enter into our lives to make them what we want. God comes into our lives to save us from everything that would separate us from God. And God comes to experience the truth and brokenness of humanity as one of us, to come so close to us that we can reach out and touch him. The gift is God with us, Emmanuel. We will never, ever be alone. Christ has come. Christ is coming. Christ will come again. The angel speaking to Joseph in our gospel story, but that angel is also speaking to us, children of God, 2,000 years later. And that angel says, do not be afraid. God is with us. Amen. Please stand and join me in professing our faith using the ancient words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he became incarnate from the Virgin Mary and was made man. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. With the Father and the Son, he is worshiped and glorified. He has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy, Catholic, and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Prayers of the People, Forum 6. In peace we pray to you, Lord God. For all people in their daily life and work. For this community, the nation, and the world. 
for the just and proper use of your creation. For all who are in danger, sorrow, or any kind of trouble. For the peace and unity of the Church of God. For Michael, our presiding bishop, Mark, our bishop, Kristen, our priest, and all bishops, priests, deacons, and other ministers. For the special needs and concerns of this congregation. <coughs> Hear us, Lord. We thank you, Lord, for all the blessings of this life. We will exalt you, O God, our King. We pray for all who have died, that they may have a place in your internal kingdom. Lord, let your loving kindness be upon them. Hasten, O Father, the coming of your kingdom, and grant that we, your servants, who now live by faith, may with joy behold your Son at his coming in glorious majesty even Jesus Christ, our only mediator and advocate. Amen. Amen. Let, us let us confess our sins against God and our neighbor. <laughs> Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry, and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us, that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy on you, forgive you all your sins through our Lord Jesus Christ, strengthen you in all goodness, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. Amen. Please stand. The peace of the Lord be always with you. Christ loved us and gave himself for us, an offering and a sacrifice to God. Amen. 